Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I am Carol Maestriani, Executive Director of Birmingham Bloomfield Community Coalition. I am absolutely thrilled to have Officer Marissa Miller here, who is the Police Liaison Officer for Bloomfield Hills Schools. And this program is brought to you by the Bloomfield Hills PTOC Health and Wellness Committee. Um, our mission is, and I'm a member on it, to build resilience in our community focused on health and wellness for our students, staff, parents, and supporting groups that is impactful, timely, and relevant. And these are all the beautiful people who are on this. And it's all about making sure that we have the right education and programs in place for our students, for our parents, and overall community. So this is just one of them. And who is Birmingham Bloomfield Community Coalition? We've been around since the early 90s. We were actually started by parents, moms at Seaholm High School when they saw what was going on during spring break, didn't like it. And then all of a sudden the rest of the community got around it, became a formal nonprofit. By 2004, Bloomfield Hills joined us because we were originally Birmingham Community Coalition. And we have actually the biggest territory of any of the prevention coalitions in Oakland County. We're very fortunate in Oakland County. There is nowhere else in the country like us because there is a community coalition for all of our communities. Um, we're youth focused substance abuse and use prevention, mental health and wellness. We are research driven evidence based, which you're gonna see in a moment. And we are 100% youth focused. Everything we do has to do with making sure teens have a voice and a presence on things that are important to them and their peers. I have Kelly Michelle here, who's our youth program coordinator. We, our youth action board is made up of high school teens from our 10 public, private, and parochial schools. So we're the most inclusive of any group and the only one that really brings in all students from all those different schools. And many of our families, they have, you know, one student will be going to a private school, another would go to the public. So this is just a real beautiful way to get everyone together and working together as a whole community. So the first part we're going to start off with is giving you an idea. We have been doing surveys since 2005. And it's one of the things because we are been federally grant funded at least most years is there's a lot of I's to dot, T's to cross and everything we do has to be proven. So that's why we're research driven, evidence based. And so, for example, in December 2022, we administered a survey to 4,275 students. These are from Birmingham public, 7th through 12th graders, Bloomfield Hills public, 7th through 12th graders. And we end up, after cleaning, we use 4,004 surveys. So let me explain a little bit about our survey process. We work with IBH Analytics. They are a professional company. That's all they do. They have PhD level. Um, not only statisticians, evaluators, and they have expertise in the areas that we work on. We're about prevention, secondary prevention, and truly for us, the whole idea with prevention is, is you don't want to see something on the survey. However, we don't live in a perfect world, so yes, things do get on there, and how we really interact a lot with the Youth Action Board is we listen to them. What are they talking about? What are the trends? And then we make sure to put it on the survey so we can start getting a snapshot of what's going on with our students. Um, this is something that we also, for each question, because not all, it's a pretty lengthy survey, not all students answer all questions. So if they didn't answer it, each one is recalculated to only use the number of students that actually responded. We also, it's 100% anonymous. We do not collect IP addresses. I know that's been a question because they use their Chromebooks. You have to collect an IP address if you want to actually track it back. And I can tell you with over 4,000 surveys, we're a very small team. There's no point. You know, that's not our goal. Our goal is to get that pulse on the community with our students. We also do an aggregate or a census survey, meaning that we survey all students unless they opt out. Because you can also do a sample where you just take certain students from certain grades and things like that. Um, also, just so you know, most national surveys are generally a thousand responses or less. So we're actually very fortunate in these communities to have something that shows the voice and the thoughts of our students in our community that's statistically significant. 
So here's what we have. And I'm going to also give you some insights in terms of what to look for when you're actually looking at survey data. So the first thing is, as you see, we have the pie chart on your left. And we have a pretty even distribution of grades. Why this is important is, is you have, let's say, too many younger students that could pull your numbers in a different direction as, as the same thing if you had too many older students. So by having a nice balance, we're gonna get some really valuable information out of this. Then on the right is gender. We have a pretty even split between male and female. Once again, can be very differing point of views. Another thing we've done over the last few years is we have taken extra steps to really understand the LGBTQIA plus community. We have worked with key um, school leaders, with students, as well as best standards in terms of using you know, survey um, information so that we, not only we look at gender, we also look at sexuality. In this way, because we're able to, we have our own, this is a self-designed survey. So that means we have raw data. What raw data allows you to do is you can take different questions, as I'll demonstrate as we move forward, and actually look at, for example, if these students are using these substances, well, maybe, you know, what mental health issues do they have going on? And, well, how does it fit for male or female or the other, you know, population, LGBTQIA+. So the first thing we're going to look at is past 30-day substance use. And just so you know, um, for us to be able to compare nationally as well as to be a federal grantee, there are something called the four core measures. And so it's always based on 30 day past use. And this is something that um, we're able to ask the same question in the same way. We're also able to look back and trend it. Um, 30 day use, we also, another key point um, to know about the survey, we do it at the exact same time every year or every two years. So it's always the first two full weeks in December. Why is that important? because you want to keep the variables the same each time. For example, we always will have Thanksgiving before, but it's not like we're going to switch up and maybe have prom or graduation season, things like that, because that can actually change the results that the students are giving us. So as you'll notice that alcohol is the drug of choice. It always has been, even though we've seen so much vaping and everything. Um, Alcohol still is right there, and this is past 30 days. We also, another key point to look at, so you notice we have 13.5%. Well, what is 13.5%? I mean, it's so easy to manipulate data to tell a story. That's why we also like to tell you the end. So of those 4,000 students, that was 330 of them. And this is um, just high school, so just high school. And that's followed by any vape, marijuana, vape with THC, vape nicotine, vape flavor only, cigarette, et cetera. Um, the other substances, we always look at all of these. You just never know. But for the most part, our communities, it, these have never been an issue. So now we're going to look at past year use. We have the same, you know, now past year, 20.3% for alcohol. So 494 students. It all stays, you know, the same in terms of the order. Um, of popularity. What I want to point out to you is, see how we have past year use and we just looked at 30 day use? This doesn't really tell us the full story. You need to look at by grade, okay? So this is past year by grade. And remember it was 20.3 for alcohol. Well, we have in the purple eighth grade, the ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, and then overall. Well, in actuality, our seniors are up in the like around 38% use. So that's why it's so important to have this information by grade. The second thing is, is you see how it's kind of like a stair step? Mm -hmm. To me, these are moments of opportunity that as um, students, as educators, as preventionists, we have these opportunities that we can educate our students. We can help them gain that level of resilience and knowledge and things like that. So then that way, maybe we can prevent from the next level. You can see it's that way for every single substance. Mm -hmm. But isn't that fascinating how different it is when you go from the aggregate to the by grade? And then it's really a matter of, as, a, as community members, how many students are too many?
You know, we need to all decide that and to work together. We also, I'm going to be showing you some national comparisons. And this is something that's a benchmark in the prevention world because generally you never want to be as bad as the national average. So if you look, so past 30 day alcohol use, and we use monitoring the future. That is the gold standard. It's out of U of M. It's a national survey. They generally survey over 20,000 students. It's obviously a sample, not an aggregate like ours. However, what's interesting, they do 8th, 10th, and 12th grade. So for us to do all of the grades, we're able to actually compare to many different surveys if we wanted to. We only choose theirs because we know that they have the right standards behind their practices and how they administer this. Look what happens by the time we get to 12th grade. Our 12th graders are maybe a smidge higher than national average. This is something to be concerned about, you know, in terms of for alcohol. Because one of the things, and you look at past year, you know, we're not quite as high. However, the most accurate is looking at past 30 days because the students have the best memory when they think back 30 days. I mean, us, I don't know about you, it's like I'll walk out of the kitchen and it's like, you know, why did I go in my living room or something? Do you know what I mean? Students, obviously, they're much better than I, but still, going back a year, it all blends. Um, now, I'm only going to show you two trend charts because there really is no point to look at trends right now. What happened with the pandemic is, is that we know students use, misuse substances when they're together. Um, that wasn't happening very much during the pandemic. So everyone's numbers, you know, the use went down across the category. It has not quite leveled out yet. We're really looking forward to December of this year to see what that brings. However, what I do want to show you is, as you can see, whether it's past 30 day or past year use, we go all the way back to 2009 in this because this, the question has to be asked in the exact same way. If we change the wording of a question, we can no longer compare it. I want to show you that prevention does work. As you can see, look at how, I mean, past year use, or we're up all close to 60% of high school students in the past year had used alcohol. And look what can happen. You can see there's blips along the way. I'm just showing you that it's kind of like what you pay attention to and you take active intentional steps towards, you can make a difference. So just because something looks this one way now doesn't mean you can't make it better. Now marijuana use for a national comparison, once again, our 12th graders are getting right up there regardless if it's past 30 day use or past year use. We look at vape, vaping a few different ways. We look at it with nicotine, we look at it with THC, we look at flavor only and all together. Very few um, surveys do this, but it's very, it gives us a lot of clues because not all vaping is the same. So this is vape with nicotine. And we know that nicotine is probably the most addictive substance out there when it comes to the brain. Matter of fact, there's many heroin addicts who say they would rather get off of heroin again versus nicotine. So as you can see, um, the vape with nicotine, you can see the numbers here in terms of we're below national average. But once again, how many students is too many students? Then this is vape with THC, which there's a misperception amongst our students. They actually believe that vaping with nicotine is worse than THC. Well, THC is the part of the plant of marijuana that gets you high. Think about it. We have medicinal marijuana is legalized. Recreational is legalized. We have families in our communities who work for these companies. And they have, I mean, multi-billion dollar industries. They're letting people know that this is okay. Um, so, but it's interesting. We have, once again, our 12th graders. It doesn't matter if it's past 30-day use or past year use. They're above national average, vaping with THC. And we actually had, if you want to go, it was in October, um, onto the Bloomfield Hills website under the Health and Wellness Committee or on our website, bbcoalition.org. Kelly did a deep dive, a deep dive on vaping. So everything you want to know about that, you can learn there. Now, I'm just putting this out because this is supposed to be the generation where there were no more cigarettes. 
Unfortunately, tobacco is a company, it's a business, it's a big business. And what happens when you own a business and it's not doing well? You want to try and get your profits back. So enter the vape, um, and that's why they go off after the you know vulnerable. And so they went after our kids, and they made vaping seem safe. And now it's too late because so many of them are addicted to it. And that's why we have been working so hard for so many years. We were right on top of it. And I think it was 2017 when it really hit our communities. We abandoned everything else and just focused on that. Um, but what is interesting, if you notice, both past 30-day use that the green and the yellow line, um, green is combined, yellow is the high school, as well as past year, it's starting to trend up a little bit. And it's actually, if you get young people, by the time they get into their 20s, if they've been vaping for a while, that's when the cigarette use really comes in. So, yeah, they, 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 got, they got what they want. We need to take our kids' health and well-being back and not let big money, once again, you know, dictate what's happening with our youth. One of the most important questions we ask is, um, we ask this for a few different ways. So if you ever found yourself needing help related to a drug or alcohol problem, who would you talk to? So we have in the blue, you can see, doesn't matter if it's middle school or high school, they generally will go to a parent or a friend. Then you notice in the black, those are like doctors or the school, people in the school, things like that, where they're at most of the time. Now, what's interesting is people in the blue, they don't necessarily, especially friends or maybe even parents, you know, because I mean, having your child come to you, how many parents would be able to be calm and open to a conversation if your child came and said, hey, you know, I've been drinking a lot, I'm vaping, whatever, and not have their parent lose it. Because our children, out of anything, they do not want to disappoint us. So that's why creating that safe environment where your children can come to you with most anything to talk about is so important. However, I'm in the blue, so these people are not necessarily the best equipped. And then in the black, they're better equipped, but they're not going. The red is what's most concerning because these are the students who either did not know who they would go to or they would go to no one. What does this mean? This is that fright, flight, or freeze response. And think about it. If you do not have a plan, if you're in a situation, you're not going to make the best decision. So in middle school, we have 264 students who did not know or, or, or they would go to no one. We have 372 students in high school for a total of 636 of our students. 636 of our students did not know who they would go to or they would go to no one. These students are at high risk. So us as you know, preventionists, as parents, as schools, we have to work together as you know, police, we need to work together so that we can get our young people, our students, to identify who is their person. It's been proven it only takes one adult, one adult. And we've even heard it at our Youth Action Board meetings. It doesn't matter if it's the janitor or anyone, someone who just sees you. Our, our children, our students, they want to be seen. They want someone, an adult, to notice when they're off. And they want to connect. I mean, you think about it from a human level, we are hardwired to want to connect. We want to feel like we belong. We want to be seen. So think about that. And each one in here, we can do that for someone else's child. We're, it's truly about it takes a village to raise our children. So now we're going to move to mental health. And just so you know, um, we actually really shifted our focus back in 2013 to mental health. You know why? Youth Action Board. Before the kids would come in, they would be talking about, oh, we use these drugs at this school, these drugs at that school. And I'm not saying that there was a lot of drugs, but you talk about, well, what's happening at your school? What's happening at mine? Well, guess what? 2013, they started talking about stress, anxiety, depression. Interestingly enough, nationally, this was starting to come. And we also saw one of the things we ask on the survey is about influences. And for example, there can be positive influences, there can be negative influences. And generally, parents was always up at the top three, regardless of substance. You know, my parents, they have you know, rules, they talk to me, whatever. Well, they started dropping in 2013, bless you. And they started dropping nationally. This was at the time 
um, the iPhone and other things and social media really took off. So ever since then, we have really focused on mental health. And we also know that our students, our children, they're not going to just wake up one day and go, hey, I think I'm just going to vape or I'm going to drink. No, there's the mental health, there's those feelings. The feelings they don't know what to do with is what's going to actually trigger them into taking different steps to try to self-soothe or medicate. So one of the things we've actually been looking at for quite a long time is on the left is actually a typical depression screening question. So during the last month, did you ever feel so sad or hopeless every day for two weeks or more in a row that you stopped doing your usual activities? So we had of high school students, almost 25%, 555 students. Middle school was 123 students for a total of 678 of our students felt this way in the past 30 days. And then on the right, during the last month, did you ever feel so anxious or stressed that you found it difficult to do your work, take care of things at home and or get along with other people? We had over a thousand high school students 47% of them feel this way. 248 middle school students, 33%, and overall, almost 1,300, almost 1,300 of our students felt this way. Now think about it, because we're all energetic beings, and meaning that we can feel each other's emotions without that people saying anything. If you have someone come and walk in a room, you can tell if someone's really angry. They don't have to say a thing, you can just feel it. And on the other end of it, if someone is really excited and, you know, you get kind of swept up in their enthusiasm, you feel that too. Well, think about it. Our children, our students are with each other in the classrooms. So if they're not aware of this, they might not realize that what they're feeling may not even be them. They may be picking up on other students. So this is a whole nother area to be looking at. But I just wanted to point this out because this is something helpful to know as a parent that, you know, kind of take a, take a step back, you know, if your child comes home, they're feeling really stressed and just kind of ask them a little bit about the classroom and, you know, and it may, may find out that maybe it's not all them. They may just be picking up on someone else's. They don't have the language or the knowledge because they've never been this age or stage ever in their lives. Think about that. They still, even at these ages, they depend on us. We're there as, you know, as parents, it's kind of like a facilitator, a guide, a coach, a navigator at these ages, um, just to help them with this, because they don't know. So we also, during the pandemic, we started, we did in um, May, June, 2021, like a snapshot survey. We just needed to know what was going on with our students. So we actually took a deeper dive into mental health, looked at it in five different areas. So we broke it down by had less fun doing things than you used to, felt sad or depressed for several hours, felt more irritated or easily annoyed than usual, felt angry or lost your temper, and then felt nervous, anxious, or scared. And then students responded in terms of they either felt this way never, some of the time, most of the time, or all of the time. So had less fun doing things than they used to, over on the far right in the red and blue bar, those are the most of the time or all of the time. So they felt this way most of the time or all of the time during the past 30 days. These are our higher risk students and there were 547 of them. We also looked at this by gender and females tended to be two times more likely to state that they had less fun doing things over the last 30 days most of the time or all of the time compared to the males. Not saying that our guys are not having issues, it's just the females are having a little bit more. We also looked at, so this is where I talked to you, how when we, you have that raw data and you're able to compare different questions, while well, we took these mental health questions, looked at it for students who answered in a similar way on the substance use side, and we learned that students who had the less fun doing things in the last 30 days, most of the time or all of the time, two times more likely to have vaped THC in the last 30 days. Oh, let me back up really quick. What this helps us do is right there, if you're talking to a young person and you find out, you know, they mentioned something, I just haven't really been having fun. Oh, well, how long has that been going on? I don't know, 
know, you know, however long. Oh, well, so how often do you feel this way? You know, if they say, oh, not too often, then okay. Well, I actually, you know, a lot of the time. Okay, now we know, then we're not, maybe not in the same conversation. Look at, well, there is a probability that maybe they are using, they do turn to a vape to help with that. See how it ends up being a decision tree? And it also helps us delve a little bit deeper. You never get all the answers you need in a survey. This just helps point us in the right direction. So then that way we can come together and figure out what needs to be done next. So during the past 30 days, how often you felt sad or depressed for several hours. So this is, once again, our most of the time and all of the time students were 481 students. And now our females were 3.8 times more likely to state they felt sad or depressed for several hours, most of the time or all of the time during the past 30 days. And then this one has the most substances that they would turn to. And that is 2.4 times more likely to have drank alcohol, 2.3 times more likely to have used marijuana in the past 30 days, almost three times more likely to have used e-cigarettes with nicotine, 2.7 times more likely to have vaped THC in the past 30 days, and then 2.6 times more likely to have vaped any substance. So right here, we can see, and what's also cool about these five different areas is they manifest, they show up a little bit differently. You can notice when someone is anxious versus depressed or angry, you know, versus just kind of blah type of thing. So that's another thing that's good about this. Now, this is felt more irritated or easily annoyed than usual, and are most of the time or all of the time, 842 of our students. Remember when I talked about what's happening in the classroom? Think about this. You know, there's 842 students out there who feel this way most of the time or all of the time during the, any, that 30-day period. So that's impacting the classroom. And then females were three times more likely to have felt this way most of the time or all of the time. And then in terms of the, you know, the substances, so this is felt more irritated or easily annoyed most of the time or all of the time, 2.2 times more likely to drink alcohol, 2.2 times more likely to have used marijuana in the past 30 days, 2.7 times more likely to have used e-cigarettes with nicotine, 2.3 times more likely to have vaped THC, and 2.5 times more likely to have vaped any substance. Then in terms of angry or lost their temper, females are 2.0 times more likely to state they have felt angry or lost their temper compared to the males. In terms of angry or lost their temper, I can tell you that this one um, was like around number three um, in terms of the top ones. So they were also two times more likely to have used marijuana in the past 30 days, 2.7 times more likely to have used um, e-cigarettes with nicotine, 2.3 times more likely to have vaped THC, and 2.3 times more likely to have vaped any substance. You kind of see the trend here. Vape is in all the categories. That's why even though alcohol is number one, we have to keep an eye on that, this vaping, it's so accessible. And they don't even have to own one. They can just use their friends. And so often, they do. They just use their friends. So during the past 30 days, how often have you felt nervous, anxious, or scared? Most of the time or all the time, 781 of our students. So this is the second most felt. Females are 4.3 times more likely to have felt this way compared to the males, most of the time or all of the time. And then in terms of substances, for most of the time or all of the time, they feel this way. Two, two times more likely to have drank alcohol, to have used marijuana, Two and a half times more likely to vape e-cigarettes with nicotine, 2.3 vaped with THC, and 2.2 2 .2 times more likely to vape any substance in the last 30 days. So we also asked them who would they go to if they needed help related to stress, anxiety, and or depression. And once again, you can see fairly similar that they tend to go, whether it's middle school or high school, there is a shift. Middle schoolers are more likely to go to their parent. High schoolers, mm, friends are looking much better. Um, once again, we have the doctors, the teachers, coach, athletic trainer, principal, religious leader. And then we have our, our group in the red, which is they either did not know who they would turn to or they would go to no one. 
259 middle schoolers, 390 high schoolers for a total of 649 students. That's a lot of students, a lot of students. So now I am going to turn this over to Officer Marissa Miller. Thank you. Uh, just a little background about myself. I've been a police officer for 21 years, and the last 16 have been here in Bloomfield Township. And before I was in the school security position, I was on patrol for 14 years. So I responded to a lot of house parties, a lot, a lot. Not my favorite call. So uh, we have plenty of uh, experience on this and just how it impacts all our students. And then now that I'm in the detective bureau, I see the follow-up and, and what else is done with uh, anything that's happening at these house parties. So I'd like to start out first. It is uh, a township ordinance that states that it is not legal to host a house party. What does that mean? It just means, so the, the whole purpose of the house party is this, just the unregulated use of this creates those serious social problems, including but not limited to injury and harm to persons and property caused by the vehicles that are operated by these children who are leaving the houses um, that are less than 21 years of age and that are under the influence of alcohol or controlled substances, disturbing the peace. That's how we get a lot of these calls. It's a 911 call. There's, it's loud. It's 10 o'clock at night and it's loud. That's how it starts. And then, of course, the devastating effects upon minors at the public at large. It's further determined that the regulation of these house parties involving alcohol and controlled substances by our minors, and minors is anybody under the age of 21, requires somebody to sponsor that to assume that responsibility, that host, right? So here it says prohibiting persons less than 21 from attending such parties would significantly reduce the incidence of these problems. So uh, of everybody under 21. So this is just the definition. This can be easily found on bloomfieldtownship.org's website under the ordinance section. And if you just search house party, and this is the actual section that it's under that we enforce. Um, I'm not going to read it all, but uh, when we say the law states that if a party has been organic, creatively, or I know in some movies it's portrayed that they can be organic and all of a sudden, I don't know where all these people came from <laughs> and they just brought their own alcohol. And then the reality, that's not true. That's not how it happens. It always happens. Uh, my parents are away for the weekend. Uh, there's a handful of parents who actually host them as well. So uh, there's that host, again, that minor, that individual that hosts this party. And um, they actually, there is a sense of liability that occurs with that. So... Um, Part of the law states if, if this were to occur, you have to say stop, please stop drinking, that the host should make a, at least a reasonable effort, and if they don't, then you're supposed to call law enforcement. But that's kind of funny when uh, there have been many house parties that we've staked out, that we've just sat and just listened to and see how it, and I remember one house party where they said, the cops are coming, and it was just kids just running everywhere. And we looked at each other, we're like, but we're already here. <laughs> so who called it in? It was, one, it was the host. It, it just too many kids got there, and he just wanted a lot of people to leave. And well, surprise, we were here. <laughs> so we're like, no, let's go back in. Uh, <laughs> so um, that's one of the corrective actions. Um, and then to report the unlawful possession and consumption of the alcohol to the police. Um, so, and just by definition, ho hosting an open house party, all these words that we use is a social gathering of persons at a residence or premises other than the owner of the residence or premises with those rights of possession to the residence or premises of their immediate family members. What does that mean? They just have care, custody, and control of that house at that time. They, they had permission, basically. Um, we don't have hotels here in Bloomfield, but homes, apartments, condos, you name it, anything that's a dwelling. Um, and the, here's the control of the actual party. This is the law. It's unlawful for any person to have control of any residence to allow a house party to take place or continue once it has begun and fail to take corrective action. And the corrective action was already uh, defined earlier. When the person knows an alcoholic liquor or controlled substance is being or has been possessed, consumed at a house party by a person less than 21 years of age. There are exceptions, obviously. So here's part of the evidence. 
the defendant, i.e. the person that we, we find responsible for it, has control of the party, has control of the premises, the house, that residence, that, that care, custody, control, and they knew a minor, so it only just takes one, just by the letter of the law, of one person under 21 consuming in possession of an alcoholic liquor. And in Michigan, our body, we tell minors, your body is, an alcohol, is a container, and whatever you consume, now you're in possession of alcohol, because you're not supposed to have any. Um, so there's two different violations here. There's obviously the person under 21 who has consumed alcohol. That's a minor in possession, right? And it is a state civil infraction. It used to be a you know, misdemeanor, but now it's a state civil infraction. And so this is town ordinance saying that's not a fine. It's just a fine of $100, but then there's also some other, uh, is that a, some other things that the court can order, like the community service, uh, substance training, abuse, and classes, and such like that. And minors in possession citations do go on a driving record. And that's just the easiest way that we're able to keep track, because they are alcohol offenses, so they would appear on, their, on the minor's driving record. And it's just an easy way to keep track. And then Secretary of State can choose to whether if it's a reporting alcohol offense or it's not. I don't understand those guidelines, but it's on a driving record. Uh, if there's another violation, if there's a second subsequent violation, then the fine goes up about $150, $200. If there's a third violation, it goes up. Now, hosting a house party is an automatic misdemeanor charge here in Bloomfield Township. It's a 90-day misdemeanor, meaning the punishment is up to 90 days in jail for hosting an open house party. Knowing that a house party is, is occurring at your residence, you knew about it, and did nothing, didn't take any corrective measure or any sort of responsibility. It's, a th it's not a thousand dollars, I'm sorry. It's a 90, 90 day misdemeanor. And it is required court appearance. So you do have to hire an attorney. And there are some attorneys that specialize in these, in alcohol offenses. And the 48th District Court is notorious for being a little bit more harsh on alcohol offenses. Not just open house parties, not just MIPs, but uh, drunk drivers in general, we tend to give higher bonds because it's, it's a very violent way. If, if somebody has ever, if you know of anybody who's ever been killed by a drunk driver, it's horrible. My own agency lost an officer to a drunk driver back in 2004. So we take it very seriously. And, uh, and the 48th District Court prides itself on trying to set those examples of people who were caught with alcohol or anything. We normally give them to uh, the ones that I've written to, when been older siblings, the 18, 19, 20 year old sibling who invited his friends and told his brother, yeah, your, your friends can come over too because they're the ones that had care, control and custody of that house. Uh, very rarely have I, I don't know if I've, I know I've not written a person, a parent, but I have heard of parents saying, well, I would rather, I'll allow kids to drink at my house because it's safe and I'm providing that safe space it's a crime. You're contributing to the delinquency of minor and you're hosting an open house party. You just need, need one extra guest. So it's, it's not really safe. It's against the law. And uh, another thing we like to tell parents, we tell the students, because they assume it's, since it happens off after hours, we do call the school. So Monday morning, we do call your school. So if, if they don't get in trouble with us, a citation or any just being there, we do call the school and we tell like the dean of or the assistant principal. Yep, so and so was at, at an open house party this weekend. This is what the officer, the, the signs of intoxication that they showed to the officer that day. So it doesn't just stay there. We have to notify parents and in school. Oftentimes, so there's a couple, there's two camps generally for parents as, as their children get older. There are some where it's just you don't use alcohol until you're of age. Then there's ones who feel that they want their children to learn how to drink while they're still at home before they go to college. And one of the things what I, I personally believe that parents don't think about when they host a party, even if it's a small gathering and they have their children's friends there, is that do they know if any of those children are on medication? Do they know their health issues? Do they know what the core values are of that family? 
Do they know if there's a history of addiction in that family, which I'm going to talk about in a moment when I get to the brain development. These are things that will change the trajectory of that child's life in that family's life. And we have had students in our greater community, one of them I re remember in particular, ended up at the ER because of the reaction to the substances, the alcohol and other things that they had taken in. And it's like, as a parent, you know, it's okay. This isn't about judging anyone. It's just, you know, do, you know, be informed, make the best informed decision for you and your family. However, is it really okay for you to do that to someone else's child? So just something to think about. Just think about when we're coming up to prom and graduation season, how are you going to protect your, friend, your child's friends, you know, even if you think it's okay for your child to drink? That, that'll be your decision. So anyways, do I, anything else to add? No, I'm good. Also want to share, we always have to have our Youth Action Board teens perspective. And one of them said, Parent-hosted parties might seem safe, but if substance and drugs are being used, it can become unsafe very quickly. Wise words. Another one said, many parents don't want to be responsible for things done with a substance they provided, but don't realize that either way they provided it or not, they're still responsible since it's at their home. When a parent is clueless of things going on at their child's party, that is the worst way it can be. They should always be aware of what is going on in their home and with their child so it doesn't become an unsafe environment. Leaving children home alone to a party is also popular. As well as providing their child with substances and setting up a party for their child because their child may need friends and they think throwing a huge party and getting a lot of people to come will help with that. So right, right there, it's, you know, the parent child that role got really blurred and this has happened in on occasions what is the motivation ask yourself as a parent what is your motivation for having the party and having a party where substances and alcohol as a substance are going to be allowed these are just things no right or wrong answer but at least ask yourself these questions so impact of substances on the developing brain what age do you think it takes for the brain to be fully developed? 25. Okay, good job. That's on average. Sometimes our, our boys a little bit longer. We won't hold it against them, but about 25. And when you think about it, our brains develop from back to front. So we have the physical motor coordination, emotional, prefrontal cortex, which that is your decision making, your impulse control, your executive function. What's happening with our children during these times, not only do they have hormones going on with puberty, think about this, their brain is not hardwired yet. The connectivity between these different parts of the brain is what's taking place. So it's kind of like, I think about a house that's being built, they have the wiring in the walls, you go to flip on the light switch and the lights don't come on. I will tell you that this, this understanding this helped me greatly raising my children. Because what ends up happening then is they're not all talking. The different parts of the brain aren't able to directly talk to each other. During these ages, the emotional part of the brain is generally about two and a half times larger than this prefrontal cortex, the critical thinking. So if your children have these emotional outbursts, it's not necessarily their fault. It's just their brain hasn't fully evened out and developed yet. Um, and another thing to think about too, and this is regardless of age, when we get stressed, oxygen leaves the prefrontal cortex of our brain and we physiologically cannot feel, you know, we cannot think straight. That's why timeouts are for parents too. And truly, when I learned this, I have boy-girl twins, complete science experiment, let me tell you. Um, I used to think, I don't know if this ever happens to you guys, but I would think that my children would sometimes do things to me deliberately. <laughs> like one of them, they would come in the house and seriously leave a trail of stuff all the way to the bedroom. Like, are you, are, you, are you kidding me? You can't find your, you need this to find your way back down to the living room? Once I learned this, I actually looked at him like, oh, the brain's not fully developed. And I would actually laugh and it really, it helped me really shift my perspective because they are literally under control. They should just wear 
you know, the caution tape on them, just to help remind us and remember that they are literally under control, under um, development from head to toe. Now, another thing that goes on during these years is from about 14 to 21, the part of the brain where the addiction could be is most vulnerable. This is why if you do nothing else as a parent is tell your children if there's a history of addiction in the family. So often um, we work with middle school on up. They know about heart disease, about diabetes. Oh yeah, granddad, blah, 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 kind of thing. However, there is no test you can take. There's no scan, there's no blood test. They'll tell if you have addiction. And it's not until you actually have, it only takes one use to awaken that part of the brain. And this is very, very fundamental, obviously, how I'm explaining it. But basically, it doesn't go back asleep again. So then they are having to deal with this addictive component of their brain for the rest of their life. Another way to look at it is if they have a first use before 15, they are 28% more likely at a greater risk of addiction. First use between 15 to 17, uh, almost 19% more likely. 18 to 21, 7% more likely. And then over 21, 4% more likely. So these are things our children, it, we haven't been at the just say no generation for many years. Our children, if we give them information, they want to understand, okay, mom, okay, dad, why are you telling me not to do this or to think about this in a different way? And we give them that information, they're going to stop and think a couple times. They're going to think twice before doing something. We also like looking at brain scans. So the top row is a healthy, normal brain. See how smooth that is? The bottom row is a heavy teen alcohol user. See how it almost looks like there's pits or openings? That's non-brain activity. Think about that. Our children already, the whole part of the brain isn't talking to each other. They have hormones going on, they have stress. And then you add in a substance. Amazing that they even function. This is one for, uh, on the right is a 15-year-old non-drinker and it's showing the brain activity. See how it's really lit up? That's a on the right, it's a 15-year-old heavy drinker. See how it's barely lit up at all? And then this is for marijuana. Once again, healthy brain on the left, nice and smooth. Marijuana brain, 16-year-old daily user, lots of brain activity. The brain is not fully working. This is this way for all substances, even nicotine has impacts on the brain. Just something to think about. All right, refusal skills. So this is the part, you know, wanted you to have an understanding of what's going on with substances in the community, what are the laws, um, what's going on with the brain. Now these are things that you can help your child with um, because these are things can be game changers. So of course, I'm gonna start with our Youth Action Board teens. And what we did is we asked them, what would you say or do to deal with a situation where there is drinking or other substance use going on at a party? First person, I wouldn't go into a party without the expectation of such. I also wouldn't go to a party if I don't want to be around that environment. With that awareness, I know going into the party with my mind made up on how I will react. So once again, you have that plan in place. I stick to my pre-established decision and leave if I feel unsafe or uncomfortable. And this type of thing, it's like our children, I mean, us as adults, we want to belong. And this is something we actually looked at in the survey I'm not gonna talk about tonight. That sense of belonging is even more meaningful after being in the pandemic because we were so isolated. And growing up those ages, you're not comfortable and confident in your own skin yet. So, you need to really like be able to work with your child and help them build up their self-esteem so that they do, they need that why. What is more important? They want something that they want to work towards, you know, for their current and future self that they're making decisions about. And we're going to talk about it in a future slide in just a moment. Another student from our Youth Action Board said, I would make sure that everyone was safe first and make sure that no one was being peer pressured into drinking. If I knew nobody was in danger, I would either leave or stay so that someone could monitor. Another student from the Youth Action Board, I would leave. Any situation that might lead to peer pressure or someone tricking me, slipping something into my drink is one I want to avoid. 
I would advise to not go to a party unless you have a for, for sure ride at any time you need secured. This could be a parent, close friend, or Uber. Only drive yourself if you're certain you will not be consuming any substances, alcohol, weed, etc. cetera. Um, weed, marijuana. This is very interesting. Our students get that you do not drink and drive. They actually think they drive better under the influence of marijuana or vaping THC. We haven't been able to figure out quite why yet, but this has been consistent for many years. Um, another thing that came up in the questions is that, you know, once again, like this person said, this young person's so wise, make sure if you drive that you are not going to consume. Because what ends up happening, if that, the driver ends up consuming alcohol, then no one has a ride home. Another one said, don't hang out with people that will negatively influence you to prevent the situation from happening. Once again, wise words. Not easy, very wise though, because once again, you have that momentary time that you think you're having fun, but yet there's long-term consequences to it. Refusal is easiest when you're not in the situation in the first place. Perfect. So, what your team can do. Remember your influences to make the right choice. We have a huge campaign. It's on our website, it's everywhere. And for years we ask students, what's your influence? What is it that sets your heart on fire that you can remember every day, regardless of what situation you're in? So if you're in a situation that you are at that decision point, that you can remember your influence and make the best decision on that. Like for example, you know, we've had students, they love to dance or do sports or I want to be a doctor. Well, if you're in a partying situation and you decide to partake in it, is that going to get you closer to your goal or further away from it? Another thing, have a plan ahead of time. Youth Action Board students already mentioned that. Practice what you would say. This is so important and this is something you can role play together or even if you have siblings that are kind of close in age, they can practice or friends. Like for example, I'm not feeling well. I'm allergic. That does happen. My parents will freak if I do. Be the bad guy. Parents, just be the bad guy. It doesn't matter. What is the number one thing we want for our children is to be safe. It's okay. No thanks, not my thing. No thanks, I'm good. Nope, gotta go. I'm late already. Shh, you just see them kind of like that skedaddling out the door there. I'm driving, I have to work tomorrow, I have a game tomorrow, it doesn't matter what, just have, have the excuse, excuse ahead of time. Just say no and mean it. Is it going to be for your, you know, your students, your children who are a little bit stronger in who they are? But that is something, think about it. What a gift. If as a teenager they are able to say no and stand in it, I mean, I'm an adult, I'm still working on saying no to people, you know, people pleasing kind of thing. Think about what a gift that will be and how that will really serve them long, long term. Change the subject, divert. Oh, let's go to Starbucks, the park, whatever. Or did you see YouTube, Snapchat, or TikTok? Oh, didn't hear that, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Turn the tables and be of positive influence on them. This can always happen. And then ignore them, walk away, talk to someone else, they'll get it. So these are, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are at least things that will give you a start, especially we're coming up to prom and graduation season. And then we have the summer, all times where more partying will be taking place. And then really quickly, how to tw tween and teen proof your home, just giving you some tips. It's absolutely fascinating, you know, think about it. When, when our children are toddlers and everything, we don't go, we go into someone's house and we're looking for those wall plugs, where are your guns, where's your this, where's your that. But then when we get them to be a little bit older, middle school, high school, we don't really think about the home we live in nor other people's homes and what that could look like. So for example, keep alcohol locked in a cabinet. Check on it. And just because it looks full, the bottle, Open it up. Does it smell like alcohol anymore? <laughs> How many people have heard those stories? Oh, yeah, my mom and dad never knew, you know, from years ago. Well, be the parent who knows. Um, also, don't store alcohol where you don't monitor places like the garage or wherever. 
prescriptions. We have Operation Medicine Cabinets available in our police stations, Bloomfield Township. You can drop off your unwanted prescription drugs, no questions asked. Not only does it keep others safe, like our children, it also keeps the environment safe because we do not want to flush them down the toilet. We do not want them to go in the garbage and go into our ground. Um, and we also have, if you ever need them, I didn't bring any tonight, the Terra bags, um, where you can actually, it's great, these little bags, you can put, they're small bags and larger bags. And you can dump your pills or liquids, you, sh you add a little bit of water, you shake it up, it neutralizes all of the toxicity and then you can throw it away. So a lot of different ways to actually get real prescription drugs. Just so you know that a lot of times when someone's selling a home, people um, who are looking for drugs will go into an open house and they'll check the cabinets or they'll go to grandmas or grandfathers or someone that they know who maybe is a little bit sickly and have maybe have had a surgery. I mean, young people are smart with this. Stress zero tolerance. I mean, and this is something as a family and as a parent, it's about choosing what you're going to stand for. What are your core values as a family? Because if you're constantly on your child saying, you can't do this, you can't do that, that's too much. Pick a few things that are really important to you. And what I would tell my kids, because definitely the underage usage was a huge one for me, and I would, you know, let them know I would always, before they would go out, I give them the lecture. And finally, I got to a point when they got a little bit older, I'd say, you know something? You got to humor me. I need to say this to you. I'm going to feel better if you let me say this to you, kind of thing. And or in times if they start pushing back on whatever it was, I would say, you know something? This is my job as a parent. And you know something? This isn't easy for me, but this is something that as your parent, and this is my job, I know that this is the best. And because I only picked a few things, they're not going to give me a super hard time all the time versus, you know, people who kind of dole out the consequences. You dole out too many, then they become immune to it, and then it just doesn't matter. So really think about, sit down, sit down as a family. Your children are old enough when they're middle school, high school, and actually talk about what's important. And have your children be part of that conversation. You're going to have more buy-in and you're going to learn their point of view on things, which will really help enlighten you in terms of how to manage this. Monitor all internet use. The Health and Wellness Committee just had a phenomenal um, session on um, internet use and everything, so you can go and look for that video, but that's very important to do. Um, especially, not only can they obtain prescription drugs, however, right now we have a fentanyl crisis going on. And that is one of the ways um, fentanyl is a opioid that is stronger than even heroin. And it is something that you cannot detect. And what the drug cartels are doing is all it takes is just like a few milligrams. Like you put uh, like a few, think about a few granulars of salt. You can't see that. And if someone takes it, they can actually die. Okay, and that's why we have Narcan trainings. We just had one on March 14th um, because it's about harm reduction. We literally in the last few weeks have had the largest fentanyl seizures in Michigan on traffic stops. The last one, there was enough fentanyl to kill every single person in Michigan. We have, a, according to the 2020 census, 10 million people. The one two weeks before that in Paw Paw, Michigan was enough to kill a third of our population. And then right around that same time, we had 18,000 fentanyl pills in, in Pontiac. This is a real thing. Did you have anything to add on that? No. Um, so that's why it's so important to you know, make sure that your children, they only get prescription drugs if it comes from the pharmacy, from their doctor, have them not take anything from anyone else. And that's why it's so important not just have things laying around. Monitor the teen parties. We went at this a lot tonight. And also, make sure that if you do have a party, let's say, um, and you're doing it smartly, don't put out an invitation on social media. You have no idea who is going to come, who is going to see it, who's going to forward it. And that's how you can get inundated with way too many young people. So, and one other thing with that monitor internet use, um, 
Other things that are happening on the internet just really quickly is um, also there are different um, pages that will teach young people how to die from suicide. And they will actually encourage them. So there's a lot of things going on on social media. I know we cannot be on our, um, with our children 24 seven. However, once again, you know, you most likely paid and bought their device. Are you checking in on what's going on? And then finally, if you're hosting a party, welcome calls from other parents. If you're sending your teen to a party, call the other parents to make sure there's supervision. And even though if there's supervision, this is one thing that I kind of learned the hard way is that as our children get different ages, when we're in elementary school, we generally know our kids, the, their friends, we know the parents, we're all kind of on the same page. Well, there's different transition points for children. So going from elementary to middle school, middle school to high school, high school to college. And what happens is, is that you, for example, for me, I can only share my experience, is that when my daughter was in sixth grade, so 11 years old, her friend who I've known since, you know, through elementary school, oh, we're going to go to the movie my mom's taking us. Cool. Yay. Well, I get a call there at night. My daughter, 11, she's with one other girl who's 11 in downtown Birmingham. Can you come pick us up? What do you mean? Where's so-and-so's mom? Well, she just left us there. Well, see, I didn't know what questions to ask because I just assumed I was with my old play, elementary playbook, you know, and I'm just pointing this out because I want to give you guys the easy button to think of things because we don't always have the questions to ask until it's too late we're in that situation. So even though maybe a parent is supervising, do you know what their beliefs are in terms of serving alcohol and other drugs about having their children use or not? Um, in terms of what does supervision mean? Does that mean that you're in the house but you're sleeping? Or are you actually actively, periodically going down in the room, kind of checking what's going on? So it's like having a, a greater understanding so then they, that way you're not blindsided thinking one way, you know, it's kind of matching expectations. And you can do this in a very non-confrontational way because it's just, you know, I didn't think any less of that family, just that I didn't know what to ask. And, you know, something everyone, you know, everyone should be able to do what's best for their family. And if it's not in alignment with where my family is right now, that's okay too. Then you can at least make decisions accordingly. Does that make sense? And then finally, set clear rules ahead of time. Once again, matching expectations. You know, don't allow beverages to be brought into the house. Um, you know, leave the backpacks at the front door. If they're going to be in the basement, do you have windows in the basement that could be open and they could put stuff into the basement. There's other ways to get around this. And just, you know, in terms of, you know, just let, let your children know if you are, you know, having their friends over or whatever, you know, really think through and talk with them. You know, talk with them ahead of time. Okay, you want to have your friends over. Well, what does this look like? And what would you like to do? And here's my thoughts. And, and it's not that I don't trust you. It's like, as a parent, you know, I, I just, you know, sometimes I have these feelings because I love you so much. So can we just talk through this? I would feel so much better, you know, if we could talk through this. And it's all, it's not so much about what you say, it's how you say it. It's how you say it. What's your body language saying? What's your face saying? What's your energy saying? So sometimes we just need to kind of, as a parent, take that time, take that deep breath, center ourselves. Think about, you know, what is our intention for this? So in that way, we can come at this in a way that our child is going to feel real comfortable having a conversation opening up to us.